Well, thank you, Sam, for that kind introduction, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in my hometown of Vancouver. Um, in, a, in about 25 days, we're going to be celebrating 145 years of confederation in Canada. And over that almost century and a half, uh, the country has changed enormously, as we all know. Some of us are almost old enough to remember those days. But uh, back at the time of Confederation, uh, the, the Canada was about 20% people living in cities and, it, and other people, the 80% living in urban areas. And now, as we know, that percentage has flipped. So we're one of the most urbanized countries in the world with 80% of Canadians living in, in urban regions. And, and over that time, of course, the country, the economy of the country has changed enormously. It's changed from an economy based on hinterland activities like the gathering of furs, fish, and logs to a modern economy, a modern knowledge economy, which is based in urban regions. So much has changed over that 150, 145 years, but not our governmental arrangements. And cities, in effect, are the ghost governments in Canada. We know they're there, but they don't really seem to appear very officially in, in, our, in our arrangements. And uh, Jim Lightbody was, uh, had, had some uh, a reference to it this morning uh, of the setup of the Division of Powers in the British North America Act. And uh, I, some of you might be interested in going and, and looking at that. I don't personally recommend it, but uh, the, the, uh, in the BNA Act, in Section 92, Section 91 and 92, there's the division of the powers, and a cities appear in Section 92 as a responsibility of the province. And it, just to give you an idea of the importance that they were uh, thought of at the time, they fit in a list between asylums and taverns. And so they're creatures of the provinces. They have few residual powers and the provinces really can do almost anything with regard to the, its cities, including dis, dismissing sitting mayors and councils if they decide to restructure a, a government. And at the time of the BNA Act, as you know, this was a process of confederation of, of provinces joining the national government. And the intention of Sir John A. Macdonald and his colleagues at the time was to build a strong central national government and to take all of the things of great importance at the time in, into the, uh, un, under the national government and leave the provinces with some of the things that were, were less important. And in, ironically included in that is education and health care, now the two giants that are, are you know, eating provincial budgets. But at those times they were largely church or, or personal matters and, uh, and not really uh, considered uh, b big matters for the states. So cities were, have been left with these constitutional arrangements with insufficient powers, with little fiscal resilience, and with weak governance structures. And they're a little bit like, like Blanche Dubois in A Streetcar Named Desire. They rely on the kindness of strangers. But very often these strangers, which are, are the, uh, the other two levels of government, the provinces and the, and the federal government, have different agendas and they have different priorities and they have different pressures. And this really leaves cities in, a, in the state that they have no real control over their destinies. I, th I think, and I'd like you to remember that phrase, control of, of destiny. I, I think if we look at the, uh, the history of the 20th century, we can see how Canada became such a, an urbanized nation. And it was through the convergence of two really dominant trends, one being urbanization and the other being immigration. And urbanization, as you probably know, in Canada was very much uh, uh, began, began with the Industrial Revolution. And one of the great expressions, probably the most obvious ex expression of the Industrial Revolution in Canada was the building of the railways. First of all, the, uh, the uh, intra-provincial trunk line railways in eastern Canada and central Canada, and then the building of the two great transcontinental lines. And as, these, uh, as the railways were built, first people began to move from farms to local uh, small towns which were per, uh, marshalling points for both the equipment to build a railway and for the provisions to provide 
uh, to feed and, and house the workers who were working on the railways. And then once the railways were built, they moved from those smaller uh, towns, those provisioning towns, into the regional towns that you can still see when you look, at, particularly on the prairies, at the CP line in the south and the CN line in the north. Uh, 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 there's a string of those towns that run through that are a result of, of, of the railways being built. And, and uh, we, we had this build up of these regional cities and then the next stage of, of movement was uh, with the, after the Second World War with the development of knowledge, the knowledge economy, the beginnings of the development of the knowledge economy, people began to move from these uh, regional cities to what have become our three great urban regions, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. And people moving through a career, whether it be an accountant moving up in their firm or a media person moving up to a bigger and more obvious job, tended to move into the, the, one of our great urban regions. And if you look at the rate of growth after 1950 of those three urban regions, you see a very dramatic rise. And then there's the next group of cities of about seven or eight cities that also had growth, but at a much slower pace. And then virtually all of the rest of the cities in Canada have been very, uh, almost flat in their growth over the last half century or so. And so there, there is this tremendous uh, move from the countryside to smaller places, then ultimately the big drive to build up our big, our large, our three large urban regions. And immigration was another and uh, t t tremendously important uh, factor. Uh, the, the European, the first European migration to Canada was largely through push factors in home countries. So it was things like in Scotland, the, the highland clearances and the breaking up of the clans pushed people, uh, mostly the poorer uh, people, farmers, uh, out of the country and they uh, crossed the Atlantic Ocean looking for, for better, uh, better opportunities. Uh, the Irish famines and, and uh, the food shortages in, in Northern Europe as well pushed people across the Atlantic. And those push factors uh, helped to populate the country. But the first big uh, immigration to Canada came at the start of the 20th century when Sir Wilfrid Laurier uh, and, and his uh, minister that he had appointed for the task, uh, Clifford Sifton, decided that the, there was risk to Canada in the fact that the West was so empty, that the prairies uh, were open to uh, U.S. manifest destiny and uh, they, they thought they better populate it, and they better populate it with cold weather farmers. And so they first, uh, they, they mounted this great campaign to attract farmers from the northern United States and from northern Europe. And uh, they, they uh, Sifton was very uh, uh, intelligent in the way he went about doing this. He changed the incentives internally in the department to reward people on success and actually attracting immigrants. But he also mounted this incredible marketing campaign that, uh, that went out, they were said you couldn't go down a farm road in Northern Europe without seeing a Canadian recruiting poster for farmers to come. And they created, most importantly, they created the instruments to make it successful. So land grants, uh, equipment, farm credit, uh, uh, railway lines, grain storage, all of these things to, to make them succeed. And, and really their intent was to do everything they could to make it succeed. And in about an eight-year period, roughly 1905 to 1912, that, in that period, the population of Canada went up by about 50 percent. Unimaginable in today's age when we, we have this uh, fierce debate about immigration and whether it's good for the country or not and whether we lose our Canadianism and the rest of it. They did it with, uh, be, with uh, relative uh, lack of turmoil, and they did it because they created the instruments and, and, and they wanted to succeed and they wanted, wanted to make it work. And um, the second great immigration push came after the Second World War and uh, of people leaving war-torn Europe and, and coming over and looking for opportunity. And, uh, and then in, in a, the late 60s, the great uh, policy man in the, in the Pearson government, Tom Kent, uh, invented the point system which rewarded uh, human capital. It rewarded education, work experience, language capacity, and, and that had the huge benefit to Canada of making our immigration system essentially colorblind, because it didn't matter which country you came for, 
from, as long as you had this capacity uh, to participate in the economy. And, and the, 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 if to, to, in urban terms, to look at these immigration periods, the, the first, the Sifton Laurier period was farms to farms. The, the post-World War II period was some farms to farms, rural people coming, but, but a lot of it people coming from uh, cities to cities. Uh, for construction and and uh, and that ki that kind of work. Since the about 1975, it has been people coming from large cities in Asia and and China, primarily South Asia and China primarily, to the, uh, the large urban regions here, coming to uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. Those trends can have converged to make us such a, 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 an urban city, but we remain trapped in the past with these governmental arrangements. And one of the ways you, you, you see us trapped in the past is the, the uh, maldistribution of votes in, in the, both in the federal parliament and in the provincial legislatures, that a typical rural riding has about 75,000 voters, and a typical urban riding has 120, 125,000 voters. So the rural voice is much stronger in our parliaments and legislatures. And if, if you wonder if that matters, it does matter. Uh, the uh, urban planner in Toronto, Joe Barrage, some years ago, uh, did a study of, a word occurrence study of what they talk about in Hansard, and he picked out a, a group of typically urban terms like transit, HIV, AIDS, and put it against rural um, uh, terms like, uh, you know, foot and mouth disease and, and uh, grain rates. And what he found is that they talked about rural things at, at, sometimes at a 50 to 1 ratio more than they talked about urban things. So it does matter what, what they, uh, th th this, uh, vote distribution. Now we have several problems of sorting it out in Canada. One is that we have a, a variety of things like the Senate floor uh, uh, clause and the grandfather clause that in effect keep it unequal as part of the uh, original, some of it as part of the original confederation deals that are made. But the, uh, this, this is something that of particular interest at this moment because the federal government has passed Bill C-20 which increases the number of seats in, in the House of Commons. And now it's left to provincial boundary commissions, who are at work as we speak, uh, to figure out how those seats are distributed within the provinces. And typically what happens is that you get a strong presence at these hearings, they hold public hearings, and they take submissions to protect the rural voice. And very seldom do you get the urban voice stepping up to the plate. And we've been working now with the Mowat Center at the University of Toronto with Matthew Mendelssohn on a project to try and, and, uh, and enliven the urban voice in this process. And so I would encourage you to pay attention to this. If, if, if you want, I gather most of you are Vancouverites, if you want Vancouver to uh, be, uh, the Vancouver region to be better represented in this process, find out about these Boundary Commission uh, hearings and participate in it. The seats are gonna be added in the Lower Mainland, in the 905 region around Toronto, and in uh, a few seats in Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, so those are the three main affected urban areas that need to have some redress for, for their lack of uh, uh, effective representation. So what needs to be fixed? We, we need to fix the, um, the money issues, the finance issues, how cities finance their activities. Canadian cities are over, overly reliant on property tax. They rely on it for about 50% of their revenues. And by way of comparison, in the United States, the cities rely on property tax for about 15% of their revenue. And in Europe, it's about 5%. And in those other jurisdictions, they have access to other taxes. Those of you who know tax will know that the biggest tax instrument is the income tax, and it's really big. And then there's the sales tax, and it's pretty big. And then property tax is, is a good-sized tax, but it's a relatively uh, inflexible tax in that it doesn't move with the economy. It's a virtue and, and a problem with it. Tax experts will say that cities need, any government uh, jurisdiction needs 
a variety of tax instruments, a, a, a variety of revenue instruments, so they, they can balance off the various side effects or distortions in every tax. For instance, some taxes encourage you to improve your property and others discourage, discourage you from doing it. So they need to be able to respond to economic conditions and to their strategic intentions by balancing a set of, uh, a set of uh, revenue instruments. It, it's worth noting, and Greg Clark, the uh, UK urbanist, points this out, that uh, cities, uh, major urban regions like Vancouver, uh, tend to export to the, lo the surrounding areas, the, uh, in, in this case it would be the province, between 25 and 40 percent of the taxes that are taken out by, uh, by governments out of the, the, uh, the urban region. And, and that's a fact of life, that redistribution is a fact of life. In, in the Toronto region, the, the greater Toronto area, that's uh, about $15 billion a year that moves out. I don't know what the number is in, in, uh, for Vancouver, but I would say it's 4 or $5 billion a year. Gordon might know that, that number. And, and it's a sig significant number that, um, that, that can go towards city building, at least a portion of that. I think all Canadians agree we want to uh, help out parts of the country that are less productive, but we, uh, we, we need to, to uh, be able to build our cities at the same time. So we need to sort out the money uh, situation. Uh, we need to sort out the powers. Uh, many people have made the argument that Canadian cities, uh, that the urban regions in particular, uh, need something more akin to the powers of provinces. And this would include control over the healthcare system. And I know when I talk to people in the healthcare, the doctors in the healthcare system in the Toronto region, because of our 50% uh, immigrant, 50% uh, uh, diversity uh, proportions, they're not only different, uh, dealing very often with different pathologies in, in uh, what they're treating, but they're almost always treating, uh, dealing in different protocols of care. And so having some control over that is important. Teachers say that uh, with the waves of uh, students coming through, a, a school can change its, uh, its makeup in, in the course of two or three or four years. And, and they need to have the ability to respond to that and not have to go to the province for uh, changes in the way they can approach things. And we do a lot of work at, at the Maytree Foundation and Immigrant Settlement and we need a lot more local control over the uh, programs and, and, the, um, and, and the provision of things like housing and transit at the local level to, to serve the immigrant population. So we have a control of destiny problem in our cities in Canada. And uh, you'll, you'll remember in, uh, when Paul Martin was very interested and in, in involved in, in cities. Um, he talked about an old deal and a new deal for cities. And the old deal was very much, I think, handouts. It was cities saying, we should get a grant for this and a grant for that. You should give us money to pay for our, our new, uh, the Canada line or for a new subway line or a new uh, transit line of some sort. I think the new deal for cities has got to not be about handouts, but it's got to be about taking some control of our destiny and some responsibility for it. And I think it is really all about the ability at the municipal level to, lev to levy taxes. I would say a sales tax is a great place to start, but over time I think we might consider income tax as well. We have to understand, I think, in, in Canada, and in, 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 uh, Jim Lightbody mentioned this this morning, that not, one size does not fit all. Cities are different. Even, even our large urban regions are different one from the other. And so we need to, uh, to use a Jane Jacobs word, we need to uh, have particularity and we have to make sure that we're responding to what is actually needed. When, I've got, when I wrote my book Urban Nation, I went around and talked to a bunch of people across the country. Everybody thought the current situation didn't work for them. The big cities don't think it works for them, the towns don't think it, the rural municipalities, they don't think it works for them. And, and that's because we try and fit everybody into one approach, and I think we need to become more particular the way we do that. I think there's a real challenge for mayors and councils in Canada, and I have a lot of sympathy for the position they're in, but I think they need to aspire to be an equal order of government. I think they need to uh, embrace both sides of the ledger, not just expenditures, but they need to really pay attention to revenues and take responsibility for revenues. I think they need to be prepared to take the heat on the revenue side 
and not just focus on ex expenditures and not just ask another level of government to provide them with money and have that level of government take the heat for an increased taxation or, or, or a transfer. I think they need to accept the responsibility of, of explaining what they need the money for and selling the public on that. And there is great experience in this in the United States, of, surprisingly to me, I've found out this in the last few years, in building new transit lines in places like Salt Lake City and Houston, uh, they go by plebiscite to uh, the citizens of the area, They're the most tax averse country in the world in my view, and they, they spell out what the transit line, where it's going to go to, uh, they're, they're, they guarantee that the money from the uh, tax will be dedicated to the building of this transit line, and they now typically get these things passed 60, 70, sometimes even 80 percent. They routine, ro routinely get them passed, and I think our City councils and, and, uh, and, and our mayors need to be able to shoulder the, that kind of responsibility. And, and that's the way, I think the only way we're going to break out of this paradigm of building cities bit by bit, just trying to patch up things rather than have a real uh, capacity to fulfill our vision of what we want our city to be like in the future. So we have challenges to face. Uh, I think we know that competition is city region to city region. In Toronto, we know we're competing with New York City and Chicago and Boston and London as, as financial centers. Vancouver is competing in, in Cascadia with Seattle and, and, and Portland. Uh, Calgary is competing with Houston and Aberdeen as petro centers. We know that the amenities and quality of life attract knowledge workers. We have to have the capacity in our cities to build that, and you've done a brilliant job here in doing that. We have to look at what European countries are doing in transit and downtown uh, vitalization and look around the world at the tax instruments they're, they're getting. And when other countries are equipping their cities and we aren't, because we can't agree whether it's the province or the federal government's job, we simply fail to compete. So I leave you with this thought, that Canada will continue to pay a high price for having governmental arrangements that are so comprehensively out of step with our future challenges. Thank you.